Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. My name is Patrick Curran. I am chair of the Java Community Process Organization. I'm going to talk about careers and uh, getting involved in defining the future of Java. <coughs> I apologize. Anyway, so thank you for coming. A uh, little bit about me first. I'm kind of a mixed background. I, my family is Irish. I was born in England. I live in the United States. And I'm married to a lady from Turkey. So I'm all kind of mixed up. Maybe that's why I like to travel. I love to travel. My first time in Latvia. Hope it won't be the last. Uh, very glad to be here. And when I do travel, I always like to search out some music to live music to go and listen to. I was in uh, Rio de Janeiro last month, just before Carnival, and managed to hear some good samba music. And I was looking around on, on the web last night and found a jazz club here in Riga. <coughs> this guy playing uh, hard bop, which is music that originated in New York in the late 40s and 1950s. So it's interesting that uh, the two places are very far apart, but uh, Obviously, music somehow bridges cultural uh, differences and geographical differences. Music really is a universal language. Wherever you go in the world, people like it and understand it and uh, like to share it. Well, I like to think, uh, oh, so this is an example. I was in Congo last year. Uh, I don't speak very much French, just a little bit, but uh, I love Congolese music. I got on really well with the taxi drivers because they were all playing my favorite rumba music and uh, I got the opportunity to go and meet these guys who uh, have a religious choir uh, and uh, do some dancing and singing with them. So universal language, technology is similar. Uh, I travel all over the world uh, to various conferences and uh, we get a nice mix of people and no matter where people come from they all have share the same passions and the enthusiasm and by getting involved in technology, this is a way that you can do the same. Make new friends, advance your career, and have fun. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I've been in this business for 30 years. I never intended to become a computer person. I was an academic working on a PhD in economic history. I was spending years in a library uh, searching through 19th century books and manuscripts and stuff. Of course, this was way before the web, but I said to myself, "This is there's got to be a better way of doing it than this." It was kind of random, you know. You physically, you, you're picking up books, you're looking in the index at the back, you find a reference to something else, then you got to try and track it down. And I said to myself, "In the future, people will do this differently. I don't know how, but there'll be some kind of magic lookup machines or whatever uh, that will help them to do this." And eventually, I said, "Maybe I'd like to try and." get involved in technology and make that happen. So I went to technical school, learned to program assembly language in COBOL and taught my way into a programming job. <coughs> I'm going somewhere with this. First computer I worked on uh, was an IBM mainframe. I think it looked like this. I say I think because I never saw it, because of course you didn't. They were hidden away in some basement somewhere, and all you got to see was the terminal on which you typed and punched your cards, uh, created a big deck of cards. You'd take them somewhere, you'd hand them in, you'd wait 24 hours, and then they'd come back and say, oops, you've got a syntax error in line three or whatever, and you'd have to start the whole process over again. So you've got to be very good at debugging mentally, work your way through the program in your mind before you submitted it, because with a 24-hour turnaround, uh, it could take you a long time to get it right. <coughs> I did get a, my first job, I was given a choice. Uh, the boss said, there were two rooms, there was one room over here, he said, you can go work with those guys in there, and a bunch of guys in uh, shirts, and they were wearing ties, no jackets, but smartly dressed. And they were coding COBOL on COBOL, uh, coding pads, you know, you had these sheets with little boxes in. And then he said, oh, you can go over there. Uh, and in the other room, there was a bunch of scruffy looking guys and there were wires and single board computers all over the place. And they were wearing jeans and had beards and stuff. And I said, that looks more, more like fun. I'll go work with those guys. So I did. And we worked uh, 
creating business systems, believe it or not, and process control systems on single board computers, and originally, later, the very first uh, PCs. That was my computer they gave me to work on. One megahertz processor, eight kilobytes of memory. The only storage was a cassette uh, that took uh, little cassette tapes. And I programmed in assembly language, of course, which uh, those of you who are familiar with the internals of the VM will recognize that uh, Java bytecode is really just an assembly language for uh, a virtual machine as opposed to a real machine. But uh, with only eight kilobytes of memory, uh, the only way to cram anything in, it was either interpreted basic, which is uh, every character in your program took up one byte of memory. So uh, we used to use variable names that were one character and two characters long because any more would use up memory. So the, program, the programs were pretty much unreadable, but that's what we had to do to fit them into these little machines. Um, <clears throat> after a couple of years, a uh, manager came to me one weekend, one Friday, and said, you want to go to California for a year, work on word processing systems and assembly language. I said, well, I don't know. I uh, never thought about it. He said, well, let me know. Next week, next week, I said, okay, what have I got to lose? That was 1982. Uh, I'm still there. I went for one year and extended to a second year. I worked on this word processor, which in those days a word processor was uh, not a piece of software, but it was a physical machine. It's actually a, basically a specialized CPM microcomputer with two uh, five and a quarter inch floppies. It had its own printer, and that was a real luxury to be able to type stuff and uh, modify it on screen after I had spent months and months and months typing. Uh, several hundred pages of my thesis on a typewriter, where the only way you have of correcting something is that little white goop that you can actually, uh, you know, uh, white out the letters and then retype them. So uh, I worked on word processing software, but the company didn't go anywhere, it went bust. I got recruited into another company called Interactive Systems, which was the first company ever to commercialize Unix. Um, we worked on porting Unix to uh, various hardware uh, systems, mini computers uh, and mainframes and later PCs. In those days, everybody thought they needed their own version of Unix. It seems kind of quaint now, uh, but given there's basically only three or four operating systems in the world, um, the notion that anybody who was a hardware manufacturer would take the trouble to actually create and maintain their own operating system uh, seems, like I say, a little odd today, uh, with the exception, of course, of uh, Oracle and IBM and maybe HP, uh, Fujitsu. Most people have decided that it's easier to share, to work together, to, to create uh, and develop uh, Linux and to advance it that way, rather than spending their own resources to create an entire operating system. But anyway, we put Unix onto the very first IBM PC, 640 kilobytes of memory, 10 meg hard disk. Uh, IBM had no idea how to sell it, even though they had this wonderful uh, Charlie Chaplin uh, slogan uh, and good ads, but uh, they, they were unable to sell it. Um, as an aside, going back to the music thing, uh, in those days, <coughs> when I was hiring people, because I was a manager, I didn't see a lot of people who had Computer science backgrounds, uh, today that seems to be almost a prerequisite, you just take it for granted. But back then, people didn't have those degrees, so I had to figure out whether somebody would make a good programmer. And it took, didn't take me very long to realize that if they were musicians, if they actually composed or played music, there was a good chance they'd be a good programmer. Uh, I think it's because it's a combination of the uh, kind of mental ability that you need to visualize stuff, but also the notion of elegance. Uh, you know, when you talk about solving a problem, you can have uh, you can have multiple ways to solve the same problem, but people will look at them and say, this one is ugly and this one is elegant. Well, that's the kind of musical sense there. So I hired musicians and they turned out to be good programmers. <coughs> Another job, by the way, I haven't done any interviewing through all this time. It all just follows one from the other. Scott McNeely at Sun Microsystems was beginning to get a little worried because PCs that he'd always said, they're, they're toys, they're not going to do anything. What you need is a good Unix workstation from Sun Microsystems. But the PCs were getting not toys anymore. They were getting bigger and faster and cheaper. And he thought he'd better hedge his bets and uh, put Solaris, which was their version of Unix, 
onto PCs so that if they really did take over the world, you wouldn't be pushed out. So we were the world's experts at doing Unix on Intel architecture systems, so they bought the company. And I helped to port Solaris to uh, Intel systems and then managed a bunch of people developing the Intel specific pieces of that system until some decided, oh, we've changed our minds. We're going to shut everybody down and lay them off. Uh, so they did, which is why they're it, they, it still exists, Solaris on Intel, but it didn't really go anywhere. Um, I managed to find another job inside Sun working on uh, conformance test suites for Java. Uh, and at that time, most of my developers were in Russia, not very far from here. Uh, I had one team in St. Petersburg and another in uh, Novosibirsk in Siberia. I said I love to travel. My wife says I'm probably the only person she knows who, when he's told, OK, you've got to travel to Siberia for your job, said, yeah, that sounds fun, sounds interesting. So I did. I used to go to Siberia. Way, where is it? Way over here, Novosibirsk, right in the middle. <clears throat> and then eventually I ended up chair of the JCP. The, the guy who was the previous chair was my manager. I said, you've had enough of it, I have to take it over. I said, that sounds good to me because, again, I get a chance to travel. And then it was now. So why am I saying all this? Uh, you're thinking about your career and trying to figure out how to prepare yourself for the way things are going to be in the future. You've no idea what's going to happen. Uh, when I started, first of all, I never intended to even be in the computer business. But when I ended up there, there was no, no laptops, no networks, no email, no internet, no GUIs. No cell phones, nothing. So, you know, and back then we couldn't have predicted the way things are today or even 10 years in the future. Similarly, looking, standing here today, thinking about how things are going to be 10, 10 years from now, uh, very difficult to figure it out. All you can really predict is that things are going to be different from the way they are today and that you don't really know how they're going to be different. So, here's an example, okay? Back then, you could spend $10 million and buy a Cray XMP supercomputer. Uh, this is more powerful. We're now carrying supercomputers in our pockets. Um, nobody predicted that. And certainly people didn't predict. Maybe people said, well, computers are going to get faster. But if you remember way back at the very beginning, the early predictions were uh, the worldwide market for computers will be somewhere between 30 and 40. In the early days, that was what they thought. So the notion that we all carry around supercomputers and the amazing things we do with them, just people had no clue. So you couldn't back then have said, okay, how am I going to plan my career so that when Facebook or Twitter or whatever happens 30 years from now, I'm going to be in a good position to get a job with them. You can't. So switching metaphors from music to surfing, I think of this as being like surfing. I've had about seven different jobs, uh, but they all flowed from the first one. Uh, so the best you can do is put yourself in a position where opportunities will present themselves and then you will choose the opportunities that look most interesting to you. You can't do much else. So you've got to kind of position yourself, go somewhere where there's some good waves, choose an interesting one and jump on. Uh, may not take you where you expect to go, but uh, hopefully it will take you somewhere interesting and you'll have fun along the way. Um, so. That's the kind of background to uh, planning your career. So you can't plan. You've just got to be, I don't want to say opportunistic. You've got to, be, you've got to make your own opportunities. And we'll talk in a, in a little while about how you can do that. But uh, that's what we've got to do. So it's about teamwork, really. Teamwork creates opportunities. So you need to be getting together with other people, connecting with them, collaborating with them, creating stuff together, like making music together, which is why I assume you come to events like this to meet other people, uh, to learn, uh, and to collaborate and connect with people. <coughs> so another way of doing that, to switch into my real subject, is get involved in, in standards. Uh, the world that we live in would not exist, in, in, wouldn't just wouldn't be here without standards. They define everything from uh, physical stuff, you know, machines and, and social things and business processes and so on and so on and so on. There are hundreds, literally hundreds of standard setting organizations uh, around the world, of which the JCP, which I run, is one. 
the important thing about standards is if you have a standard for something, then you can have multiple implementations of the thing that that standard defines. In the early days, again, when I started, um, if you bought a machine from IBM, that was it. They owned you for life because the only people that made uh, the peripherals that would go in that machine was IBM. Uh, you had to get the software from them, you had to get your training from them, you had to get your documentation from them. Everything was proprietary and you were locked in. And people don't like being locked in. They like to have choice. Uh, they like to be able to say if one vendor goes out of business, or if their prices get too high, whatever, you can swap them out and swap someone else in. Uh, you can only do that if the things that you're talking about are defined formally through some kind of standards so that more people than one, than the people who originally created them, can actually create uh, implementations or compatible versions of these things. <coughs> so people are build industrial strength systems, you know, global supply chains, uh, uh, airline management systems, ATM networks, uh, satellites, telecommunications, and so on. All of these guys really insist upon standards. They, they are very much afraid of being locked into any particular technology, to any particular vendor, so they want their stuff to be defined and built upon, upon standards. In the IT world, we have two kinds of standards. First of all, uh, languages and protocols. This is the Tower of Babel. You probably know the story. Supposedly, in the very early days, uh, humankind all spoke the same language and for some reason they decided that they would build this big tower and build it all the way up into to heaven. And God looked down on them and said, you're getting too big for your boots here. I don't approve of this. I'm going to punish you. And the way he punished them was to divide them into groups that spoke different languages so they could not understand each other. Uh, <clears throat> I did this talk in Vienna uh, a few days ago and a guy came up to me afterwards and said, you can go see that picture. It's in the museum in Vienna. So I did. Uh, anyway, languages and protocols, so the languages that we use to communicate with machines, the computer languages, or the protocols, the, the, the networking protocols that we use when machines talk to other machines. And these all have to be standardized. And the other kind of standards that we care about are interfaces, software interfaces. When I was working on that little uh, Commodore PET machine in assembly language, we had no libraries, no routines of, of any kind. We had to write everything ourselves. Even something as simple as you want to get input from the keyboard, you had to go to a particular location in memory and watch it, and then as a key was pressed, a particular value would appear there and you would grab it. Today, you can just pull off the shelf, off the web, uh, as you know, libraries, and if they're well-defined and well-designed, you can plug them together and uh, very quickly construct software. So in the Java world, we... Uh, have our own standards. We develop them through the Java Community Process Organization, and I'm going to talk about how, how we do that. It's a community-driven process, <clears throat> not like the Windows world. With Windows, what you get is what Microsoft decides you're going to get. I mean, look at the disaster that was Windows 8. For some reason, they go off in this bizarre mode, and they say, OK, this is, this is what you're going to get. Uh, that's not the way Java works. Java is developed collaboratively through the JCP, the Java Community Process. We develop specifications that we call JSRs through a formal process that is very similar to the process used by other standard setting organizations. Um, anyone who's interested in the community can take part in this process. And it's important to note that uh, even though Oracle is the leader, if you like, uh, of this whole business, uh, Oracle's competitors, the people who compete very heavily with Oracle, are actively involved in collaborating with Oracle to develop Java. So IBM, HP, and Red Hat, for example, all bitter enemies of, of Oracle. They're all members of the JCP, and they all work together with other people in the organization uh, and also uh, with uh, people outside to develop and to advance Java. We also have members from the open source community and the developer community, uh, the Eclipse Foundation, for example, Java user groups, and so on. Excuse me. Don't, don't need to go into the details here. The point I want to make is we have three main platforms, Java SE, Java ME, Java EE, and each of them consists of a number of well-defined pieces, chunks, uh, APIs, uh, 
technologies, and each of these typically is defined by AGSR. There is a formal specification for the interfaces, for how they work, for what they should do. And because we have these formal specifications, it's possible for other people, other than Oracle or whoever it was who was leading a particular effort to create one of these JSRs, to create an implementation and to have a high level of confidence that that implementation will function and behave the same as the original, because you're both operating from the same specification or blueprint, if you can think of it that way. <clears throat> so, a JSR uh, defines a single version of a particular Java specification. It's led by somebody from the community, typically, uh, a, a, typically a company. It's possible to do this as an individual, but it's, it's really hard work. The leader is called the spec lead, specification lead, and the spec lead recruits uh, other people from the community who are interested in helping, and they get together into what they call an expert group. And uh, <clears throat> the expert group has three things to deliver, not just the spec, but also what we call a reference implementation, which means a complete implementation of that spec, and a test suite. We call it a TCK. Other people would probably call it a conformance test suite. And the purpose of this test suite is to verify that implementations of the specification do what the specification says they should do. Um, <clears throat> and you build these three things together. Uh, and the process of doing so makes it kind of difficult because, in a sense, it would be easier if you had the spec first and then you would just build an implementation and the tests. But you have to work on them all simultaneously. But that's actually quite powerful because in the process of building them, each of them will strengthen the others. So, for example, when you uh, are working on the implementation, you're going to find some problems in the spec. You may find ambiguities. It may be that the spec is not implementable because it's missing some critical piece or because it has contradictions in it. You will find that out. Um, when you build a test suite, similarly, you will find problems in the spec. You may say, this language is not precise enough. I don't know how to write a test for it. And then when you run the tests against the implementation, you'll find bugs in the tests and bugs in the implementation. So you have to build all of these three, and you deliver them all at the end of the process of developing the JSR. And we put within the JCP what we call compatibility testing, what others might call conformance testing, is absolutely central. Every implementation of a Java specification must pass the conformance test suite, and that way you have a really good uh, assurance as a consumer of this stuff that if you pick up a formal uh, tested implementation of a Java specification, then the odds are very, very high that it is going to function the same as somebody else's, which is where you get this opportunity to mix and match. <coughs> and uh, if something is compatible, then you know, get stamped with a seal of approval, which is like a hallmark, if you like, uh, the Java trademark. So this is how we're structured. Um, I'm the chairperson. We have an executive committee, which is like a board of directors. Small administrative staff work for me. These represent the expert groups led by a spec lead, and this is the broad membership of the organization. The executive committee is a mixture of big and small companies. It's a mixture of companies that implement Java, such as Fujitsu or HP or Oracle, of course, uh, or people who consume it, Goldman Sachs, Twitter, whatever. We have some individuals, a couple of individual members, and we have two Java user groups. So we like to try to, to ensure that the executive committee is representative of, of the broader Java community. Uh, we've actually got three Brazilian members on, on the committee, which is why we were meeting in, uh, in uh, Rio de Janeiro last month. Uh, the uh, <coughs> membership, uh, we've got about nine, a little under a thousand members. There are no fees. Uh, three quarters of the members are individuals. Most of the rest are corporations, but we do have a number of nonprofits, mostly Java user groups. These numbers are a little bit misleading because for each corporate member, there will be many employees of that corporation participating in various activities. Uh, not sure of the exact ratio, but it probably comes out to at least 10 to 1, maybe around 10 to 1. So, uh, so it's not that three quarters of everybody doing stuff in the JCP is an individual member. <coughs> Um, location, 40% North America, about 40% Europe, 13% Asia, 6% uh, South America. So reasonably spread out. 
as I said, we've got a formal process for developing these GSRs. I'm not going to go into the details. If you're really interested, you can look it up in the process document, which is a formal specification of how this all works. But basically, you have a submission. You get a vote on it at the submission process by the executive committee. You produce one or more early drafts. You go into a formal public review process with a more formal, more complete version of the spec. There's another vote by the executive committee at that point. A little more work on it, and then when it goes final, you have to deliver the, all those three things. Remember, just the, not just the spec, but also the reference implementation and the TCK. And there's another vote at that point. And then there's a formal process for maintenance also. And all standard setting organizations have similar processes. <clears throat> um, switch gears for a moment uh, and talk about how we change the way the organization itself functions. I think of that as changing the constitution. And our constitution is basically two documents. There's the one I just mentioned, the process document. Oops, sorry. And the process document defines the way we are structured and the way that we govern ourselves and the processes that, uh, that I mentioned about submission and voting and so on and so on. And the second document is, the, is a legal agreement, is the membership agreement that you sign when you join, and that focuses on intellectual property uh, rights and, and licensing and issues like that. <coughs> and these two documents together define the specification for the JCP. So since we have a process for developing and revising specifications, which is the JCP itself, we use the same process to define or change these documents. And over the past few years, uh, we've been working on a series of JSRs to modify the way the organization functions. Collectively, we call them jcp.next. Um, <clears throat> and let me just talk about a couple of them. The first one was quite simple. Uh, people used to say this was how expert groups operated, that uh, a bunch of people got together sort of secretively behind closed doors, they worked on something. Sometimes this would go on for years, uh, I mean literally one, two, three years. At the end of that time, something would pop out the other end. You'd get a spec, but you would have no idea why, <coughs> excuse me, why decisions were made, uh, what tensions there were, what compromises were made. Uh, it was just all kind of hidden. Um, it wasn't always that way, and it wasn't that, but there was some truth to this. So we said, okay, that's simple to fix. We just mandate that everything be done in the open. Uh, remember, the JCP was formed 15 years ago, way before open source and stuff like that. So, you know, back in those days, it was sort of expected that, that things would be done in a kind of hierarchical, waterfall style manner without a lot of public involvement and, and collaboration. But the world has changed, and we just said, okay, let's, let's do things the way everybody seems to want them to be done. So these guys must do their work out in the open. They must use public mailing lists. They must have a public issue tracker. They must publish all, not just the final results of their work, but the working drafts as they go along. They must publish their meeting minutes. They must be open to receiving comments from, from the outside, and they must respond to those comments. And this was a very simple JSR to do. I mean, it, it sounds like a no-brainer. In fact, it, it was. It took us only a few months to finish it. Uh, it was very well received. And as a result, we saw a significant increase in, in developer involvement because people could now see what was happening. Um, and they became interested in, in watching and, and in participating. And a couple of Java user groups created a program that uh, they called Adopt to JSR, which I will talk about more later. <clears throat> um, another JSR, which uh, actually, fin we finished this, what day is it today? Uh, we finished Tuesday this week. The final vote on this JSR uh, closed at midnight on Monday this week. Um, and this was a JSR designed to encourage individual developers such as yourselves to join and to participate in, in the JCP. Uh, we've always had individual members. Remember the chart, the slide that I showed you said 75% of our members are individuals. <coughs> but for many of them, it's difficult to join because you have to sign that JSPA, that legal document. And that is a big, scary legal document. It's 12 pages long. It contains very squirrely language uh, to the extent that lawyers who are experts 
uh, two lawyers can read that document and they will disagree on what particular sections of it mean. Uh, so for, for the average developer to read it and to understand it is, is a bit of a stretch. Um, <clears throat> people probably just scan it through and say, yeah, whatever, and sign. But there's another thing that you have to do if you're an individual, you have to get your employer to sign a, an addendum to that document. So put these two things together and that's an obstacle for, for many individuals to join. So we said, okay, let's create a new class of membership specifically designed for individuals with a much simpler membership agreement that people will actually understand, hopefully. And let's get rid of, for this class of membership, the requirement that they get an employer signature. So that's what we've done. And that's, uh, as I said, it's just went final on Monday. And by the way, most other standards organizations don't have uh, a class of membership for individuals. A couple of them do, but most uh, just, it's not possible. Most of them assume that uh, organizations and uh, corporations will join, but not individuals. We're different in that respect. <coughs> This GSR is also creating a new class of membership for Java user groups uh, that are not legal entities. Today they sign the GSPA and that's completely bogus. If you've got a bunch of guys who call themselves the whatever Java user group and they meet in a pub once a month or whatever, but they have no legal status, then it makes no sense for one person who happens to be the leader of that group uh, to sign a legal document and, and somehow expect that that has any meaning. It doesn't. So we're fixing that. <coughs> we'll be rolling this out over the next 9, 12 months. Uh, we expect the majority of people who are currently uh, individual members to switch to this new class of membership. And we're hoping for a lot more uh, members. So we'll be having a big kind of publicity drive over the next, over the next few months to recruit more, more members. So we're doing this because we want to make sure that the JCP really is a community organization. So JSR 348 made it easy to see what was happening and to participate, and JSR 364 makes it easier to join. We're about to kick off another JSR, which will kind of focus on open source development processes. And the goal is to make sure there are no barriers to, to people participating. If people want to, to uh, get involved, uh, then they can. So. That's really my message, is that people should get involved. So let's think about why you would do that. <clears throat> um, of course, you can get involved uh, through your employer. Uh, so corporations join standards groups for a number of reasons, uh, primarily probably to influence the technologies that drive the markets that they're operating in, rather than just being on the receiving end of changes that are going to be kind of forced on them by other people. But also, potentially, it's cheaper to collaborate with other people to develop something than to try and do it in a proprietary manner. Remember what I was saying about having your own operating system? That makes no sense. Why not just work, uh, use Linux and, and collaborate on developing that? It's a way of giving developers good exposure and uh, opportunities. Uh, it can help to increase the size of their market. It can give them a competitive advantage because they will actually have the inside scoop on, on new technologies. For an individual, um, it's good karma. You will feel good about it, but that's not why I'm asking people to do it. It's good experience, and it will be good for your career. That's, that's why you should participate. <coughs> As to how, um, I've been out talking to developers for years now about, you know, get involved, get involved, and people did. Uh, and in the early days, once they got involved, then they'd be kind of stuck. They'd say, well, now what am I supposed to do? I'm a member of the JCP, so what? Uh, I don't feel that I have the stature or the experience or even the time to get involved in, in an expert group as a member of an expert group. It's just me, you know, what am I gonna do? Sit at the table with the big brains from IBM or, or Sun or Motorola or whatever. I, I just feel intimidated by that. So they would join, but then there was not much that they could do. And then, we figured out, or the user group members figured out eventually, hey, well, why not get involved through your Java user group? Then it's not just you, because you can work with your, your peers and your colleagues. You can help each other. Those who are more experienced and know more about the process can teach those who don't, teach each other, and you'll all work together as a team, and that's much more productive. So that's the way we encourage individuals to join these days and to participate. We've got a whole number of Java user groups, more than 50, 
uh, I already joined the JCP. Every time I revise this slide, I have to change the font and make it smaller because we have more uh, user group members. But they are from all over the world, uh, Africa, South America, Europe, Asia. Uh, <coughs> and we have, I mentioned earlier, I didn't name them, we have two Java user groups on the executive committee. Uh, so Java from uh, Brazil and the London Java community from London. And these two user groups together created this program they called Adopt to JSR. <coughs> um, through this program, we have user groups from all over the world participating in uh, developing uh, Java. Uh, here's an example of uh, more than 28 user groups from all over the world, South America, North America, Europe, Asia, and Africa, uh, that have participated in one way or another in helping to develop the latest versions of Java SE and Java EE. <coughs> so, I said it's good for your career to do this. Uh, in the obvious ways, you grow your network, you grow your reputation, you make new contacts, you learn new technologies. That's all good. But for me, even more importantly, uh, more important than the, the technical skills, which I assume everybody has, uh, there are these additional skills that the recruiting people and the HR people, human resource people call soft skills. And these are skills such as verbal and written communications, uh, negotiation, collaborating with others, teamwork, knowing how to put your arguments across, knowing when is the best time to compromise, learning how to, to kind of get together with other people and, and to negotiate and so on. And all of these skills are really important if you want to get on in your career. Remember I talked earlier about outsourcing. Uh, you know, I had this team in Russia. Before that, actually, uh, we at Sun, we outsourced to Ireland. Uh, I had a big team in, in Dublin for some time. Um, Ireland was close to Europe, they were English speaking, they were well educated, and at the time they were cheap. So we said, fine, we'll, you know, we'll hire them. Uh, it wasn't very long before their salaries began to rise and we said, uh, we you know, in the industry said, uh, that's, that's too much, we, we can't do that anymore. Uh, we went to Russia, most people didn't. Uh, typically others went to India and then prices in India started to rise and then they went to China and now I mean I think up in this part of the world uh, in Eastern Europe the point is no matter how smart you are there's a, somebody else in the world who is at least as smart as you who's willing to work for less money than you uh, that's just a fact of life so if you want to get on in addition to the technical smarts you need these other skills these soft skills and these are exactly the kind of skills that you will get and develop if you work collaboratively with other people in one of these community organizations, either an open source project um, or, um, or the JCP or another standards developing organization. So do it not out of charity, because uh, you're not going to get paid for this, right? Uh, but do it because it's good for you and it'll be good for your career. You don't have to be a super technical expert to get involved in stuff. Uh, there are some simple things you can do. You can help with moderating mailing lists. You can help with uh, evangelizing. You can give uh, help with a little documentation, maybe translate it into another language, uh, help with FAQs and so on. All of these are good ways to get started and will begin to build those skills which you can then develop further. But if you do want to have technical skills or you're more technically savvy, then there's a number of other things you can do. You can help with issue management, reproduc reproducing bugs and so on. You can look at the emerging uh, APIs and uh, give feedback on the design from your perspective as a developer. You may have existing software that you can port over to use these new features to test them out in the real world, or you can develop some uh, some kind of testing some programs, small programs to test out the new APIs. Remember I gave the long list of, of user groups that had helped with uh, previous versions of Java. So there was a group in, uh, in India, uh, Chennai, I think, who uh, developed uh, a particular little game for testing out some of the new uh, technologies in Java EE. Um, you can help to work on the TCK on the test suite. Uh, you can run the test suite against the reference implementation and look for bugs. 
and you may even be able to help work on the reference implementation. So a whole range of stuff that you can work on depending on your, your interests and your skills. And over time, of course, you can start small and build up um, uh, and work up to more technical stuff. There's, there's a guy, when I worked together with Bruno Souza, who's the guy who was on the executive committee, we were in Brazil together uh, doing a little tour, talking about this kind of thing a few weeks ago. And there's a guy uh, in his user group called Otavio Santana, who has only been doing this stuff about three years. So three years ago, he was just a regular developer like everybody else. Uh, and in a period of three years, by working with other people, uh, he uh, was given a Developer of the Year Award by the JCP last year as a committer on OpenJDK and has built up an international uh, reputation over this period of time. So it's a very real benefit to your job. I always give the example, if two people go in for a job and the, the job specification says you need this particular, uh, to understand this particular technology, and let's assume they both do. But, but one of them says, not only do I understand it, but I actually help to define it and to write it. Uh, my name is actually listed as a contributor. That's something I should have said, by the way. This new JSR we're just rolling out, one of the big benefits of it is that individuals who are not members of the expert group will be able to get themselves formally recognized and listed as contributors to that JSR uh, and will have their name on jcp.org. So if you're going for a job and the guy says, do you know X? You can say, yeah, not only do I know it, I hope to create it, go look me up. Obviously, that's a, a big plus uh, for your career. If you're more interested in the implementation rather than the, the specification side of things, then you can work to help to develop the reference implementation, which is the implementation of Java SE through OpenJDK, and similarly with uh, Java SE with Project Glassfish. So, number of ways you can participate. <coughs> Java was 20 years old last year. Uh, it's certainly going to be around 20 years from now. I don't know about the 25th century, but it continues to evolve. And remember, Java is not just the language, but the really important thing is the JVM underneath it. Uh, obviously, Java runs on it, but there are 100 languages that run on the JVM. And any number of different applications that take advantage of the 20 years of, of heavy-duty rocket science class engineering that's gone into making that JVM super fast and efficient and reliable and so on. So Java's going to be around for a long time. Uh, you're all young, uh, 20 years from now or whatever. I'm sure Java's still going to be around. You'll probably be working with it. Uh, you can help to define how it gets from where it is today to where it's going to be there. Then that's up to you. So get involved, participate, and help to make the future Java. That's it. We've got uh, about seven minutes left. So if anybody has any questions, I will be glad to answer them. Over to you guys. No question. <coughs> Let me ask you, how many of you are members of a Java user group? Got a user group here in Riga. Go join them. It's a good way of uh, meeting new people, and uh, as I said, it's taking the first step on that road, developing your contacts and advancing your career. Okay. Well, if there's no questions, uh, I'll say thank you for for listening, and uh, I will be around. So uh, you can always find me. Ask me later. Okay. Thank you. <coughs>